Good morning and welcome to FSC Fieldwork Live 2020. Um, this is our last session, so thank you so much for joining me. We're going to be investigating hydrology and flooding today. Yet again, I'm so pleased to um, announce that so many people are joining us from across the world today. We've got the USA, Germany, Thailand, Kenya. Welcome to everyone. It's really exciting. I'm Charlie. And behind the camera here, I have Tim with me. So we'll be taking you through this investigation in Suffolk. Now, um, obviously, because of coronavirus, we had hoped that you'd be joining us in Malham. Um, but with the restrictions in place, we're going to do our best today. OK, so um, because all of you are joining us, it'd be really lovely to welcome to you into our classroom and do a few shout outs. Uh, so, hi, Rushmore gang. Uh, keep up the good work. That's from Ms. Ross. Hello to Litchfield Cathedral School, Maidley Academy Telford, uh, the Year 12s at the Heart of England School, and I imagine Oscar's with us again today. And um, finally, to Solihull School Geographers, Mrs. Brown hopes that this will really prompt some inspiration for your NEA. Okay, thank you. Now, um, today, as I say, we'll be looking at the hydrological cycle and links to flooding in the Malham and Skipton areas of Yorkshire. Let's just have a reminder of the aim. Uh, so we're going to evaluate the links between the drainage basin characteristics, the hydrological cycle and flooding. Okay. And to do that, we've got a few methods coming up today, which is our infiltration rates, the soil characteristics, the storm runoff simulations, and we'll be going through all of those. And for that, if you have your handouts with us, then you'll be able to work through that with you. Okay? Now, uh, thank you so much to those of you who have submitted your questions before the course. Maybe some of those arose from the free course studies. And I'll be trying to answer as many of those as I can as we get towards the end of the session. Okay? But as I say, we're kind of here in this global classroom. So it would be really great if you could make this quite an interactive session. And you should be able to um, comment. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you should be able to see a chat box at the side. If you can't, just refresh your page and that should come up. So you can put your comments in there if you have a YouTube account. If not, I believe you can still uh, submit questions via the Encounter Edu website and they'll come through to us over here. Okay, so that'd be great if you could take part in that. Now, as I mentioned, we are this global classroom, so let's try and keep those, that chat to a kind of classroom vibe and um, the sorts of questions or comments that you think are appropriate to the classroom. And that would be really great to focus our learning because it can be quite distracting to have lots of random points going up the side. So hopefully you had enough time in the 10 minutes before to say hi to all your friends. I know it's been such a long time since you've seen them. Um, but yeah, if we could keep that chat focused, that'd be great. And to help with that, I have my teacher moderators with me today, Dave and Dan, and they'll be keeping an eye on those comments and maybe answering some of them as well so that you can get as many answers as possible to your questions. Now, if you do miss anything, or if you just want to spend a bit more time on something, looking over things during the session, that's no problem, because uh, it will be available on catch up. Okay, so about an hour after the session, that will be back up there on YouTube, and you can go through at your own pace. Okay, lovely. So, as I mentioned, I'm not in Malham at the moment, um, but actually, that's just a really handy demonstration of the fact that you can use these methods anywhere. So you're kind of building up your toolkit, and when you return to your studies, whenever that may be, uh, you'll be able to use some of these perhaps, and certainly the critical evaluation skills you gain in doing your own studies. Okay. So um, well, let's have a recap of that pre-course then. Hopefully you've been through this, but there's going to be a few pictures coming up on screen to uh, give you an idea, sense of Malum, um, if you haven't quite done that yet. Okay. So we're really interested today in the um, Malham area of the drainage basin, and the drainage basin is that of the River Eyre. Okay? We're looking at the upper catchment uh, from Malham Tarn, which is the source, down to Skipton, where we'll be looking at the risk of flooding. Now, some of those characteristics you might have considered during your pre-course um, might be maybe geology. Uh, stuff. So the main land use, uh, sorry, the main geology in um, Malham is the limestone and that's permeable although it's not porous there are loads of cracks and fissures for the water to run down so actually percolation as a transfer might be quite significant and that will make the groundwater store quite significant as well so we're expecting that to reduce flood risk plenty of other things they might increase flood risk such as uh, the steep slopes with a fast surface runoff for infiltration can occur 
Uh, high precipitation, even in the driest months, Yorkshire could receive in that area 60 millimetres of rain. So it might be that the soil moisture store is generally quite full, maybe even saturated. And so again, we'd see lots of surface runoff, which is a fast transfer, increasing flood risk. And finally, the land use. Um, grassland and pastoral agriculture are the main land uses in the area. So that would be little vegetation, very little interception and absorption there. So again, that water would be getting through to the channel faster rather than being stored up in the catchment. So overall, guys, we're expecting uh, surface runoff to be quite a significant factor. And with that high drainage density you'll have seen on the map um, in the upper catchment, again, that's contributing to this high flood risk. So hopefully you have some ideas along those lines from that secondary data set on the story map. Uh, and we're going to test those ideas today, see if we can support them or contradict them with our primary data by going through our methods. Now, if you haven't done that pre-course, I really do advise you to um, have a look over it because it can really help your geographical skills. There's lots of interpretation of maps and things on there. So it's well worth having a look at, okay? So at this point, we would be ready to head out into the field, of course. And that means we need to consider the risk assessment. Even though we're going to stay here, it's good to have those in mind. So um, something you might want to consider is the weather, because uh, it's quite exposed up in Mallamdale. So you'd want to check the weather so that you could be prepared with your kit. Uh, also, it's quite, as I say, it's a remote area, quite a steep area uh, in terms of topography. So you'd want to have some good maps with you so that you plan safe routes through and safe field work sites. And maybe have, well, definitely, in fact, have the contact details for an emergency contact just in case. But then there's ethical considerations as well. Not necessarily ones that are going to impact on our safety directly, but you might need to gain permission for access to sites. It can be quite hard to study a river course um, without using private land, uh, and also damage to the environment. So in this very sensitive area, we want to make sure that we are looking after it, not damaging it, doing things like taking our soil samples in situ rather than taking things away from the site, okay? So just a few things to consider there. Now, we are ready to start our data collection. But why? Why bother? Well, as um, at the start of a geographical investigation, as we did for place, and you've done for others as well, I'm sure, um, we need to set this geographical context. What is the bigger picture of what we're looking at here? Um, again, we'll look at some um, kind of background scenes, just in case you haven't done the pre-course. Uh, but I'm sure you'll have seen the heart-rending scenes from across the UK just earlier this year. Shropshire, Yorkshire, Gloucestershire, they all suffered really bad floods and other areas. And in your pre-course, in the article, you'll have seen some of the impacts of flooding within this catchment, the River Air. Well, as well as being devastating and sometimes a deadly phenomenon uh, that affects most of the country's communities at some point, it can also affect our economy, uh, the environment, and wider society. In fact, it costs 2.2 billion every year to manage floods in the UK. Um, yet flooding is actually the end point, isn't it? It all starts in the catchment as that culmination of the natural and human features and uses of the area affecting that flood risk. And as that hydrological cycle is a landscape cell system, by understanding that system, we can really get to grips with how we can manage flooding better. So across the world, um, catchments are being managed in a much more sustainable way as a result of this kind of research. So it's really important that we get going with that. Now, let's just consider our aim again. We're going to evaluate the links between the drainage basin characteristics, hydrological cycle, and flooding. So what we need to do is identify what are those characteristics? How do they affect flooding as a result of the hydrological cycle stores and transfers responding to those different characteristics? Okay, so that's what we're going to be up to. And our first method we'll be using, got my paperwork back there, our first method we'll be using is looking at some storm plots to run some storm simulations. So the first thing we need to do with any method is consider the validity. Why, why do we need to consider storm runoff? Now I've got a little diagram here. Hopefully you can see that. And um, the surface runoff is the transfer we're interested in here. And that's a very fast transfer, getting water to the channel. So if you think about your flood hydrograph, that would be a very short lag time. And it would mean that our rising limb would be quite steep, would probably see bankful discharge quite quickly 
therefore causing uh, a flood event. Okay, so that's why it's important. Um, now, Sam from our Ridder Career Center has very kindly run these storm simulations for me because he has access to the equipment. And um, he's going to be running a five litre storm, you'll see what I mean by that in a bit, and uh, explaining what happens on arable land. Okay, so if you have page one of your handout handy, you can work through this with him. Hi guys, so we're here today as part of your infiltration experiment. What we've got here is something called a storm plot, and we use this to simulate a storm event and see how quickly water gets into its river system. So what we've got here is some arable land, okay? We're imagining this is some agricultural land, and we're gonna pour some water into the system, imagining this is our storm, and see how long it takes for the water to flow all the way through and down into our riverside here. So I'm gonna pour this through, and we'll see how long it takes for it to get down into the river. Okay, so we're imagining this is now a storm, okay? There's a big heavy rain event, and this water is pouring all onto our arable land. Okay, we now need to see how long it's gonna take for the water to flow through that system and down into our river basin. Okay, so it's been about 40 seconds now and you can see that water is starting to flow into our river system. Now what that means is that water has washed through the arable land quite quickly. That's because the soil here is really churned up, it's been ploughed by the farmers okay, to make it nice soil for them. There's also not much vegetation in it which is going to block and absorb the water so it washes through really quickly and straight into the river. That can then have a knock-on effect on areas further downstream. Okay, because if lots of water rushes into the river system really quickly, it's going to flow downstream and those places that are further down in the valley are going to be more at risk of flooding. Okay, because the, all that water is washing down really quickly and the rivers are more likely to burst their banks. Okay, I'm just going to give you 30 more seconds there to finish off your notes on the limitations. And it'd be really great if you could, if you have noticed any justifications or limitations Sam's done there, uh, if you could write those in the chat box, that will be shared to me and we could share them as the whole class and that'd be really great. Maybe some of the things you could be thinking about are, why did Sam have a stopwatch? Why measure that five liters? Why were there holes in the guttering at the top? Okay, so if you did write anything, that should be coming through to me shortly, we'll see. Um, think about some of the things you might have put there. So, um, one thing was those holes in the guttering I mentioned. Well, that's to make it representative of a rain event. So if you just poured that five litres all on in one place, you would get um, more surface runoff than is actually true to life because there'd be no time for that infiltration to occur. Uh, so you just see it all run off instead. The um, stopwatch and the five litre measured storm as well just helps us with the reliability of our data because if we were going to repeat this in different areas, obviously Sam did arable, uh, and we're going to see urban and grassland in a second, which will be a stratified sample, we need to make sure we've got consistency between those. Okay. What about any limitations you might have noticed? Well, um, well, the measuring cylinder at the bottom would perhaps have been more precise than the jug that we saw. Um, it's likely that a measuring cylinder would have a more resolute markings on it, so we could get more precise ideas of how much storm runoff had occurred. Um, also, the repeats, if we did it multiple times, uh, it would be likely that the surface runoff would be more, a higher value or get faster because we're starting to saturate the soil underneath. So we'd maybe need to consider, do we do multiple samples and just make sure we have that idea of rain over time? Uh, or do we just do one? 
so that it's an example of one single rainstorm and we don't get that influence of the infiltration. And actually, that does link to a comment I've just had through, which is surely intensity of rain and duration are important. Yeah, they absolutely are. And we'll see that further as we come into our infiltration as well. Um, so that would be something you consider when you're designing your method with that. Maybe you do multiple examples of the storm runoff simulation, and that would make sure you're getting an idea of different durations of rainstorm event. Okay, so you could also be designed to do that. Thank you for, for handing that in, whoever sent through that comment. That's great. Now, um, we're going to watch now two more videos, one for urban and one for grassland. As I said, that's a stratified sample um, by land use. So we're splitting the whole basin, drainage basin into land use types and measuring each one. And we've had a look there at the kind of pros and cons of the method. But for this one, we can actually link it back to the, uh, the investigation aim we're doing, which is evaluating the relevance of this different points of the hydrological cycle. So on page two of your handout, might be up on your screen there, um, you have a series of photos, okay? And we're going to have a chance now to annotate these as we watch Sam's next two videos to say, how does this type of land use impact on flood risk? There's about 956 hectares of urban land um, in the catchment, but much more, over 16,000 hectares of grassland in the catchment. So these are quite significant influences, or could be, on flood risk if we find that there's an influence on surface runoff, okay? Now, I'll just give you a moment to read over the example annotation at the bottom of this page two here, so on the third picture. So that really shows you how you can use keywords to develop the quality of your annotation. And the really important thing is that you explain how that land use impacts on flood risk. So this here is now our urban land use, our impermeable surface. So hopefully you've, uh, you've seen that there. Uh, we're going to play two videos now, back to back, and I'll kind of talk over them so that you can have an idea of what's going on and help you with your annotations. Okay, so urban first. This here is now our urban land use, our impermeable surface. So in the urban one here, we can see that there's no infiltration because it's an impermeable surface and no interception because there's no vegetation. So there's a very high runoff. Obviously in the real world, we would see some evaporation here perhaps, but essentially it's getting quickly to the channel by this fast transfer surface runoff. So we'd see a short lag time on our hydrograph. This here is now our grassland or meadow land use. And on this grassland one, there's hardly any runoff, which means there'd be hardly any water getting to the channel from this land use type. Instead, uh, there's interception and absorption, especially in these exposed areas where you'd be seeing a lot of um, transpiration and evaporation as a result of the high wind levels. And there's more time for infiltration as well, because as the water runs down the surface, it's being, the flow is being attenuated or slowed down. So this would be a much slower version of um, that surface runoff. And instead, maybe infiltration might occur, bringing about that longer lag because the soil moisture store is now in play. And so they'd be less likely to see a significant flood event. So we can see here that there's a really significant influence of land use. Yet the grassland, we've just said, is the most common land use that should be reducing surface runoff. Yet it still floods down in Skipton. So maybe the answer is in our next transfer here in terms of infiltration. And that's what we're going to investigate next. I'll just give you five more seconds in case you're writing down ideas on your annotated photos. But remember, you can go back over this um, on the catch up if you need to. The next page you'll need in your handout will be the um, infiltration table, okay, which is actually page five. I have changed the order slightly for it to make sense with the sequence of the hydrological cycle. Okay, so our next method is going to be infiltration. And we're going to do a short experiment here, um, but it would be great if you had safe access to 
to an outdoor area uh, in your garden and you just from really simple equipment. If you could do this for yourself, um, we'll have a chance to put your data in about that as well a bit later. Um, that's because it's so much more interesting if you can watch a long investigation or a long experiment to see what happens to that infiltration rate over time and how things change. Um, if you did want to do that, you have some instructions in your handout. They're just coming up on screen now. In case you don't have access to the handout, you should be able to use those. So as you can see, it's really simple equipment. It's on page four of your handout if you need it. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at that now. And uh, on page five of your handout, as I say, there is the infiltration table. And that's what you'll need to work through this next um, experiment. Okay, so we're going to watch that now. And we'll think about the validity, the limitations, the justifications, all through that. So we're out here to get the data for our infiltration rates. But first, why is it valid? How is this data going to help us with our investigation? Well, if you have a fast infiltration rate, it means the soil moisture store is much likely, more likely to be more significant. Uh, the water will infiltrate, sit in the soil moisture store, and then eventually transfer to the channel via through flow, which will be much slower, or even percolate down into the bedrock, and then through groundwater flow to the channel. So much slower, and you're likely to have a lower flood risk. Now, lots of things in the drainage basin and its characteristics might affect the infiltration rates. So, for example, if the antecedent conditions or thin soils make the uh, soil more saturated or more likely to be saturated, you would see uh, slower infiltration rates because it would run off instead of infiltrating. Um, if there were less permeable soils, so uh, maybe uh, quite high clay concentration, that would also be a slow infiltration rate. Whereas with sandy soils, you'd see a much faster infiltration rate. So if we can find out what the um, infiltration rate is in the catchment, we can see how that might impact on flood risk. Now, we're going to test the uh, Malum soil here, don't worry, for the real data set. Um, if your teachers send the post-course webinar, then you will get data for Malum, so that's okay. Um, but I'm going to use this area here as if it were an arable area. Now, how does it work? Well, we need to think first of all about where we're going to sample. How would you sample this area? What sampling strategy would you use? I'm going to use a stratified sample. So I'm going to split it into the categories of land use. And I'm going to use uh, begin here with arable. So this will be the example you see. Even though there's less than 400 hectares of arable land in the catchment, it's the best I have access to. So we'll start with this data set. Now, uh, how do you do it? Let's take a look at the equipment we're going to need just here. Hopefully you can see that there. This is an infiltration ring. It is a piece of guttering. Um, and you might choose to use a tin can. If that's what you have available to you. Just make sure you've got the sharp edges taped. Okay. Also got a mallet or a hammer to hammer it in. Uh, and a ruler here. Plus my water and equipment. And a stopwatch. Okay. So first up, I need to hammer my infiltration ring into the surface. Now notice I'm keeping my hands well out of the way. You might like to hold it around like this if you find that safer. We can even put a block of wood across the top to hammer onto. Okay? So I just need to hammer it down to make sure that it's nice and sealed in. Okay? Now does it matter how far down um, I put it there? Well yes it definitely does. If you imagine this time I'd hammered it but halfway down and I had just 10 centimetres of space there to fill up with water that would be infiltrating into the ground. And then I go on to my next sample and I just put it in two centimetres, so maybe I have 30 centimetres of the water column there soaking into the surface or infiltrating into the surface. Well, in that 30 centimetre example, there'd be a lot more pressure of the weight of the water pressing down on the surface. And what we're trying to do here is control something called the hydrostatic head. So if I have different amounts of water each time, I'm not really getting an idea of the infiltration rates. I'm actually getting an artificial idea, which is just the pressure of the water pressing down on the surface. Okay, so I can uh, measure this here. And at the moment, that is 220 millilitres. So I'm going to write that down as my initial level. And then I'm going to fill it with water. Okay. 
Um, my water's going to go right to the top so that it's consistent, reliable, the same every time. And then I'll be timing it for my weight. Okay. So we'll fill it up to the top. There we go. And uh, we'll start the timer. This will go for a minute. Okay. So while we're waiting, let's just have a think, why was I measuring in millimetres there? Well, it's all about precision. If I'd measured to the nearest centimetre, then I'm introducing up to five millimetres of error each time because I'm rounding to the nearest centimetre. Whereas if I measure the nearest millimetre, I'm only introducing up to half a millimetre, 0.5 millimetres of error each time because I'm rounding to the nearest millimetre. That means with this piece of equipment, uh, the highest resolution I can get is by measuring in millimetres and so that will give me the most precise data. How are we doing? 45, I'm nearly there. So what I'm going to do is measure the drop each time. Okay, so it's been a minute there and it's now down to 2.10. Okay, so I've got a drop there of 10 millimetres. We'll wait for the next minute. I'm going to measure every minute for 10 minutes. While we're doing this, can you think of any limitations? Are you recognising any limitations that are affecting the quality of our data? There's a lot of confounding variables here that we can't control for, um, which will influence the rates. So it's quite hard to be representative of the whole catchment. For example, soil depth might vary, uh, the soil composition might vary across the area. So it's really important I get several samples in each category of land use as I'm going around. The antecedent conditions as well, that might vary, um, maybe different levels of saturation in different areas. So ideally, in terms of our temporal sample, when we take our data, uh, we should do it at the same time across the whole catchment. Um, and if you had a whole class, you could do that, you could spread around. Um, but obviously if you were just moving around yourself, you might have to take account of the fact that any rain or sun during the day would affect the reliability of your data. Okay, let's see what it is now. And it is 195. Okay, I'm going to carry on measuring uh, for the next 10 minutes so that you can see the full data set later. Okay, so um, I've just had a bit of housekeeping notice from our producers. Apparently earlier, when we were just reviewing the pre-course and thinking about the Malum catchment, not all of the photos um, were able to be put up because of the format they were in. Um, so just another reminder, in case you don't have a good idea of what the river air catchment is like, you can go to the pre-course and there's a story map there with all of those photos that would have been shown available for you. Okay, so sorry if you were a bit confused if you were seeing floods and it was like, this isn't Malum. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Now, uh, I'd also just say that there are a few more comments coming through as well before I follow up on that infiltration. Um, and I have to congratulate you on your use of appropriate geographical terminology. Well done. That's always a good sign. Um, so we've got here, what about land use and soil, so soil storage capacity? Antecedent moisture will have an impact as well, won't it? Well, yes, it absolutely will. As you'll have seen in that infiltration video there, um, all of these factors can impact on the soil moisture store. In terms of antecedent conditions, both you'll have noticed Sam Stormson's were, of course, outside um, they're quite a big piece of equipment so we don't know what the weather had been like there in Wales I think it'd been quite dry actually but not often the case um, and of course in terms of our investigation so it might be a limitation for the method but it could also be uh, an impact or a factor confounding variable if you like for our uh, data because out in the field different soil conditions antecedent conditions would definitely have an impact on some of our results including this infiltration one um, so, before we consider the limitations for, um, for infiltration, let's just have a think about the data there. Coming up on your screen in just a moment will be uh, the data table. Okay, so this is um, what I recorded for the rest of that 10 minutes. And you should be able to see that we've calculated the drops, so the water level, every minute we've calculated how far it's dropped down. After the first minute, it had gone down 10 millimetres, after the second minute, 15 millimetres, and so on, okay? So what we need to do with this data to convert it to millimetres per hour is times it by 60, so 
So going from a minute to an hour, and then that will give you your rate in millimeters per hour. So for the second one, 15 times 60 is 900 millimeters per hour, and so on. And you can see there that the rate is getting slower. Well, in order for us to get a reliable and representative idea of what's happening in a rainstorm, we really need to get an idea of what's happening as an average over time. If you have done any work on descriptive statistics, you'll know that we could use the mean, median, or mode for this process for working out our average. And you need to be able to justify which you use when. Okay, so let's think about what's happening here, really. Well, as the rain falls on the surface, it's beginning to soak in or infiltrate into the soil. And at the start, that'll be quite quick because there's a lot of air spaces in that soil, there's a lot of space for the water to soak into. But as time moves on, those air spaces will be sort of filled up with water and instead uh, it will either pool on the surface, so you'll get surface storage, or it will be surface runoff instead, okay? So actually, all of those measurements are perfectly valid. They represent some part of a rain event. Um, so we should make sure we take account of all of those in our calculation, which means we need to do a mean, all right? Now, I'm going to give you a moment uh, to just have a go at some of those next calculations. The data table should still be on your screen so you can use the numbers. Um, and yeah, just so that if you're doing this afterwards, you know where we've got those numbers from and you're happy with the calculation. So I'll give you a moment to look. If you can get to a mean, brilliant. <laughs> So hopefully you've had a chance to have a go at one or two of those calculations that are next in the table. And we're now going to bring up the results table just so you can check your working. Okay, so you can see on there the results. Our mean infiltration rate was 486 millimeters per hour. Okay, so that's fair enough. Um, we've done that data set then for our arable land but we would then need to consider the rest of our sampling strategy. So we'll stick with our stratified sample, splitting up the catchment land uses and measuring in each category. But could we just do that one infiltration sample in each one? Well, no, not really. Um, that would not be representative. Remember I said in the video, all sorts of things like um, the soil depth, and you've actually suggested some things as well. So different levels of soil moisture in advance, rainfall before the test, catchment's a big area, it might rain in one area and not in another. Um, all of that might influence our study. So if we perhaps do a stratified random sample and we'll drop random pins or random points on a map within each land use area, we can then visit each of those and make sure that we get a representative sample that hopefully captures some of those differences in soil moisture, soil depth and so on. Okay, so that'll be the approach we'd like to um, like to take. It's good to think about that wider sampling strategy as well as looking at the methods today. Someone's also put through on the chat, thank you for taking part, um, not measuring the volume of water. So we had our infiltration ring there, the drainage pipe, um, and because we measured the depth, that we hammered it in so that we had a constant hydrostatic head and always filled it up to the top. That's ensuring a consistent volume. You're right, we don't know what that volume was, although we could calculate it, um, but we've still got that consistency. So as long as we use the same infiltration ring in each of our locations, then we should be okay on making sure we've got that reliability. Thank you for putting that through though. Okay, as I say, it would be really great if you could do your own version of that if you've got a safe area to access. But if not, your teachers in a um, post-call webinar, if you sign up to that at fieldwork.live, and I'll give more information about that later, uh, will get a secondary data set for Malum. Okay, not for my garden in Suffolk, so don't worry, you will get that data. Right, now this brings us on to our next method. And if you go in your handouts, you should be working from page three, okay? And this is looking at the soil characteristics by doing a soil analysis. 
Now, even if you couldn't take part in the last one, I can guarantee you should be able to take part in this one. Um, you just need a tiny amount of soil. So maybe on your daily exercise, you could collect a small sample or even just from a pot plant inside, if you ask permission first, you just need a tiny amount of soil and you can always put it back afterwards. So this should be something that everyone can have a go with. And um, as ever, first up, we're going to consider why is it valid? Well, if your soil can hold a lot of water, that means our soil moisture store is more likely to be more significant. So if you have quite a sandy soil, it will be able to hold more water. OK, that means you're storing water up in the catchment. I'll show you on my diagram again. That means that we're storing water up here in the catchment in the soil. It's infiltrating into the soil moisture store. And if that soil can hold lots of moisture, it means it's holding it here, taking longer to get to the channel, and we'll have a longer lag on our flood hydrograph. So much more likely um, that we won't see a flood event. Okay. So what you'll need for this one, guys, is page three of your handout coming up on your screen, if you haven't already seen it, and a bit of water if you are going to do it yourself. And then we'll watch how we work through that flowchart process. Okay. Okay, so we're here to do our soil texture analysis and if you've got your handout ready with the flowchart on, you can work through this as well. Okay, so um, first up, you need your soil sample around there and if you just take out any twigs or stones from there, uh, and then you need to just add a bit of water and kind of mix it together. You want the moisture kind of evenly distributed through your sample. Okay. And you should be able to roll it up and have a little golf ball sized sample there to work with. Okay. Now, the next stage is to see if you can squeeze that ball and if it stays as a ball. It pretty much does, it keeps its structure, doesn't it? Okay, so moving on, the answer to that was yes. We move on to the next box, which is can we roll the ball out to form a sausage? And it should be about a centimetre thick. that that's what we're after great okay the next thing is to see if we can press that sausage between our thumb and forefinger to make a ribbon mm, I can uh, it's a bit flimsy so if we move on to the next one the tentative yes is the soil ribbon less than two and a half centimeters long before it breaks it's definitely less than two and a half centimeters long before it breaks okay so Coming down, the next bit is to take a pinch of this soil and um, make it really wet, okay, make it very wet. So add a bit more water there. And as we rub it between our finger and thumb, can you feel how gritty it is? Is it very gritty, very smooth, or in between? I would say that's very gritty, okay? I can really feel the little grains of sand in between my fingers. So that has come out as, uh, see, sandy loam. Okay, so I would record that now on my recording sheets and um, yeah, you can have a go at doing your soil texture analysis for your location. If you have taken part in that or if you're going to, do make sure you wash your hands after you've touched the soil. So our result there then was sandy loam at this end. Now, what does that mean in terms of our inquiry question or investigation aim and evaluating the impact of this on the flood risk. Well, with sandy soil, we've got large particles, as I said earlier, and there's a lot of air spaces in between them. So we're going to see a high infiltration rate. That means we've got a large uh, soil moisture store and that will be moving to the channel via through flow instead, which is a much slower transfer than the surface runoff we were talking about earlier. That means we're decreasing the flood risk. Now, just in case your soil comes out at this end, let's just have a think about what that would mean. Um, so clay, if you look at the structure of clay, it's a bit like a brick wall. It's made of little particles called platelets, and they're ionically bonded together so that you have this really tightly packed structure, which means no water can pass through. As I'm sure you know, clay is impermeable. Well, in that kind of scenario, we would see an increased flood risk because water wouldn't be infiltrating. We wouldn't see much of a soil moisture store. OK, so that's um, really important information to us in terms of determining whether soil texture in Malham will influence 
the flood risk further down in Skipton. And again, you'll get data for that um, for later on. So what might some limitations of this method be? I'll give you another few seconds if you could share them, or of course you can write them in your uh, table at the bottom here, but it'd be great if we could share them as a class. I'll wait for seeing if anything comes up on the chat. And we're remembering that justifications are really important to our data because they allow us to judge the quality of our data and therefore the extent to which we can trust our conclusions. Limitations also guide us in this, in that we can use them to explain anomalies or any unexpected trends, and that kind of gives us the counter argument. Uh, actually, can we trust our conclusions? So this balancing act is really important and there's no better place to do it than in the field. A really good point there. So um, someone's introduced an element of seasonality. Um, I suppose this is a sort of limitation on our sampling, our temporal sampling. And that doesn't mean where we get the data, but when we get the data. So we've got here with clay in the summer, uh, the clay cracks and water can infiltrate much more quickly. Well, it can infiltrate. Um, so yeah, that's a really important point. Um, thank you whoever's put that point forward. If we were getting a representative idea of the drainage basin characteristics, we should be doing this sampling in different seasons to capture that. Um, <laughs> we've also got, I mean, the elephant in the room here, grittiness is subjective. Yes, this is a massive limitation to this method, um, which brings about unreliability in our data. So when we were feeling to see if it was very gritty, very smooth, or in between. Um, that's a really subjective judgment. What could we have done about that? Well, um, if you get one person, or one student, to do the sample every time at each site, that at least brings consistency between them. Uh, or if we had been able to get together as an actual class and physically share out a soil sample, we could have done a control sample where we test it together and we can kind of make that baseline judgment of what is grittiness. Okay, so that would have been a good way of doing that. Um, yeah, lots of people put that there. Again, soil type can vary across the land use, you're absolutely right. So again, that brings in our sampling idea and just making sure we've got a really uh, representative idea of that. Gradient, again, could also be captured within that sampling approach. Okay, guys, well done. Thanks so much for um, sharing your thoughts. It's really lovely to think there's someone out there and uh, we can help each other with our knowledge. Um, the next thing we're going to do though, so that's kind of the end of that method, um, except we can extend it a bit further with something called Survey123. Now, I'm just gonna grab my tablet here. Um, so Survey123 is an app that creates surveys with geolocated data and that means as you collect your survey points the location is logged as well and this is a really exciting opportunity because we're going to ask all of you if you can do soil analysis and even better if you can do infiltration as well to create a big data set of soil textures from across the country uh, you'll need the link for that so that should be on your screen now or it's written in your handbook uh, so your live lesson handouts so don't worry if you need to um, struggle to write that down, but you'll, you'll have that access to that later. Um, something that is really important though is this location bit. Now, um, make sure please you've got your location turned on or you're putting in the map where your location is. Uh, unfortunately, if you were watching the place one, you'll have possibly recognised that we had some technical difficulties at exactly the time I was describing this for place. And uh, that meant I didn't ask you to put your location on. So if you fancy going back and putting in your emotion mapping point again for place, with your location this time, that would be absolutely fabulous for the quality of our data set. Okay, so have a think guys, why is this big data an advantage? Um, what could we do with this soil texture data? I'm gonna leave you thinking about that because in the webinar or via your teacher's webinar, um, you will be able to get access to that. Okay, and as I say, I'll talk more about that at the end. So we've sorted out all our methods there guys. And um, that means we've got a bit of time now for some questions. Okay, so um, let's have a think about what people have what people have put there. If you do have any live questions, I'm sure Dan and Dave have been asking them, but by all means, keep putting those through. Um, so thank you to the Ridgeway School. You have sent in this question. Um, what type of rock is the most permeable in the UK? 
we always like to know most least biggest fastest don't we uh, so it's a really good question for our general knowledge well i would say chalk and um, essentially chalk is both porous so it has air spaces between the particles that water can go down into that's because it was created by sedimentation um, and it also has those fissures and cracks created by natural earth movements um, that the limestone had so because it's got both of those elements it's a really permeable rock type and actually in chalk areas you don't see surface water you can even get dry river valleys it's quite an exciting thing to see also we have from Lutterworth College can we link the river hydrology to climate change and how things change over time Absolutely can. I'm so pleased you're kind of thinking about that bigger picture here, Lutterworth College. Um, it, we're already seeing the results of climate change around us. And um, in terms of our river drainage basin, this is highlighted. In fact, we're seeing frequent high magnitude storm events, more storming. So lots of rain coming down all at once. Now, this means um, while in the river air catchment, actually, there is the potential for a significant groundwater storm with the limestone, um, actually in a high intensity event, you're probably not gonna see fast enough infiltration and percolation to allow for that. Um, the water's gonna head off via surface runoff or faster transfers. Um, this also has the potential to erode the soil layers. So we're losing that soil moisture store as well, perhaps. Okay. Um, so essentially this increases the flood risk, doesn't it, for the river air. Now, this is especially true in areas of peat around the um, river air catchment, and they're much more susceptible to erosion. So that just adds to that process. Um, there's also a natural change, and um, Lutterworth College, you did, did point this out, the seasonality element. So obviously, in there's not a lot of woodland in the Mallendale, but um, there's not much chance for interception in the winter um, if you have deciduous trees. Uh, equally, in the upland, you might see frost and ice. So again, that would create um, an impermeable surface on top of the soil. So you wouldn't see that infiltration again. Essentially then flood events are much more likely because of those couple of factors uh, in the winter time. Um, and actually this is quite a fun fact. In Malham, sometimes Malham Beck, if it's icy or frozen, uh, can go straight down and over the top of Malham Cove instead of following its natural route. So it's quite a cool thing to think about. Okay, so we have, have we got any questions coming through? No, we haven't. So I'll continue with my pre-submitted ones. I'll say thank you for that interaction. Um, so we've got an answer or a question here, sorry, um, from Z at LAE, but it was sent by Miss Saracen. Uh, to what extent can human interventions decrease flood risk? Well, to a great extent is the answer. In this catchment, the River Air, the National Trust have already done some improvement works and they've blocked drainage distance sorry drainage ditches in the peatland so that means they're holding water up in the catchment rather than increasing that drainage density in the top um, the Eden Valley is a really good case study for this if you wanted to look that up it's near the Pennines and um, there you can see how they're managing farmland to reduce uh, surface runoff planting trees afforestation and that increases the interception and they're putting in natural barriers in the channel which slows down the flow and backs it up so that areas flood further upstream rather than getting all the water quickly down so remember guys we mainly know that these techniques like afforestation and that um changing the channel work because of real research like we've done today so that's a, just a bit of a pro for our study there um how are we doing one more maybe. Um, so we've got the question, what qualitative measures could be used to investigate flooding and flood risk from the Spires College? Um, so we've had a few of the bigger picture there. Now let's think about the actual process again that we're going through as students. Well, we've seen a few qualitative, sorry, quantitative methods today, but in addition, it is possible to measure interception rates by putting a kind of a sponge ring around a tree um, and capturing the stem flow and also pots underneath the canopy to capture the leaf drip. And by doing something called a mass balance equation, if you can measure the precipitation for the rain gauge and you can measure the outflow from that, so the stem flow and the through fall or leaf drip, uh, you can work out what's in the middle and that'll be your interception store. And there are quite a few stages in our water cycle where you can measure the transfers and therefore calculate the stores. So it's a really good technique for that. Um, I'd actually advise if you go to the geography 
field work website, the FSC website, there are loads of methods on there for helping you with looking at flooding and hydrology and um, loads of qualitative methods as well. So, so don't, don't ignore those. Okay, guys, I think it's, um, have we got any questions coming through? We have not, other than the ones we've already addressed. So that brings us to the end of Field Work Live 2020 for now, guys, which is a bit sad, the last session. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you've really enjoyed looking at this real data um, that we've captured here and how that can help us in our understanding of the hydrological cycle as an open system within a catchment and therefore how we can manage the impacts of flooding or the occurrence of flooding much better. Um, we've covered so much in the last two weeks in FSC Field Work Live 2020 for all ages. So for this age group, we've got Rocky Shore Ecology and the place study um, for it was technically for GCSE, but it would be great revision for this kind of age group uh, on coasts and quality of life and urban environment. And actually, if you just want a bit of fun, have a look at the ones for the younger ones as well, or if you've got any younger siblings. They're all available on Catch Up. You can get them via the Encounter Edu website or on YouTube. Either either, you'll find them there. Um, now, I've mentioned quite a few times these teacher webinars. So after the live sessions, we have a webinar, a live webinar that teachers can sign up to. You just need to go to fieldwork.live to do that. And also on fieldwork.live, we've got some evaluation forms. We'd love to hear what you thought of these sessions so that we can really mold them to your needs. So hopefully you'll join us again and we'll see you at some point in the future for a live session or maybe even at one of our beautiful FSC learning locations across the country. Thank you for joining me. Stay safe. Bye.